Welcome back, brothers and sisters. Today we're stepping slightly closer to present days than usual, unraveling the intricacies of a literary masterpiece that has long stood as a cornerstone in political theory, Niccolò Machiavelli's The Prince. Crafted in 1513, amidst the intellectual richness of the Italian Renaissance, The Prince has fueled debates, sparked intrigue, and given rise to speculation throughout the centuries. Holding a master's in political science, I find myself often standing apart from the majority in the field, and this book is no exception. What they call political realism, I see as a facade for opportunism and the pursuit of power over principle. Nonetheless, the prince stands as an invaluable historical document, shedding light on the complexities of our world and the undercurrents of political power. The true intent behind Machiavelli's words has been a subject of myriad interpretations and speculations. Some scholars and avid readers postulate that the prince was penned with a layer of irony, potentially as a satire aimed to mock or lead the prince to a downfall. Conversely, many contend that Machiavelli was laying the foundation for political realism, offering a work meant to be absorbed as a pragmatic guide to acquiring and maintaining power. In the midst of these differing viewpoints, one can't help but wonder how this text might have made Marcus Aurelius, the philosopher king, turn in his grave. Representing a stark contrast in political ethics, Machiavelli's pragmatism and Aurelius's stoicism would have made for an enthralling debate. Anyway, stay with us as we embark on this journey into the mind of one of history's most enigmatic figures, then make your own judgment. And if you find value in our explorations and discussions, consider supporting our channel through Patreon. Your support enables us to delve deeper and bring more insightful content your way. The Prince by Niccolo Machiavelli Niccolo Machiavelli's letter to Lorenzo de' Medici People usually try to win a prince's favor by gifting them things they value or things they believe the prince will enjoy. So, we often see folks giving horses, weapons, fancy cloths, jewels, and other stuff that seems fit for royalty. Now, I want to pay my respects to you, and the most valuable thing I have is my knowledge of the deeds of great people gained from studying both recent events and ancient histories. After much thought and study, I've condensed this knowledge into this little book I'm sending your way. I know this book might not seem worthy of your attention, but I'm hoping your kindness will make you accept it. After all, I can't think of a better gift than sharing insights that took me years and countless challenges to gather. I didn't dress up this work with fancy words or fluff, as some do to make their works appealing. I wanted it to stand out for its content and the importance of its themes, and it shouldn't be seen as presumptuous if someone of humble origin like me offers advice on ruling to princes. Just like artists need different perspectives to understand landscapes, understanding people requires a prince's viewpoint, and understanding princes requires a commoner's perspective. So, I hope you accept this small gift with the intention with which I send it. If you give it a careful read, you'll see my deep wish for you to reach the heights that your fortune and qualities are leading you towards. And if someday you look down from your high position to notice people like me, you'll see how I'm facing unwarranted continuous hardships. Chapter 1. How many types of principalities there are and how they're gained. Every state or power that has ever ruled over people has been either a republic or a principality. Principalities come in different flavors. They're either hereditary, with the ruling family having been in charge for a long time, or they're new. These new ones can be entirely new, like how Milan was for Francesco Sforza, or kind of tacked on to the ruler's existing states, like how the Kingdom of Naples was for the King of Spain. These acquired territories have either been used to having a prince or living freely, and they're gained by either the prince's armies, someone else's, sheer luck, or some serious skills. Chapter 2. Let's talk about hereditary principalities. I'm not going to get into republics here. That's a whole other conversation. Let's keep our focus on principalities and the best ways to rule and keep hold of them. Dealing with hereditary states, especially where the family's been in charge for ages, is usually a bit less of a headache than the new ones. If a prince doesn't rock the boat too much and plays his cards right, he should be able to hang on to his state unless something really out of the ordinary knocks him off course. And even if he does lose it, there's a good chance he'll bounce back if the new guy stumbles. Look at the Duke of Ferrara in Italy. He could never have stood up to the Venetians or Pope Julius if he didn't have a strong grip on his territories. When you're a hereditary prince, you don't have as much need to ruffle feathers, so people tend to like you more. Unless he's got some majorly off-putting qualities, it's a safe bet his subjects will be cool with him. The longer he's been around, the less people remember why they'd want someone else in charge, and any shift in power just makes folks itch for more change. Chapter 3. Handling Mixed Principalities Now, new principalities are a whole different ball game, especially if they're just pieces added to an already mixed state. People usually welcome a change of rulers, thinking things might get better for them. That's where they get it wrong. They often realize they've just jumped out of the frying pan into the fire. New princes have to lay down the law, bring in their troops and shake things up. 
which doesn't exactly endear them to the locals. You see, you've got enemies from the folks you've upset taking over, and the friends who helped you get there. You can't really satisfy their expectations, and you can't go all out against them either. Even with a strong army, you need the locals on your side to make things work. Take Louis the Twelfth, the French king, for example. He swooped into Milan real quick but lost it just as fast. The first time, the locals who opened the gates for him felt deceived and didn't put up with the new management. Winning back rebellious places might be a tad easier the second time around. You get the chance to get rid of troublemakers and secure weak spots. To make France lose Milan the first time, stirring up trouble on the borders was enough. The second time, it took pretty much the whole world against them, resulting in their armies getting kicked out of Italy. Milan was snatched from France both times, and we've talked about why the first time happened. Now let's dig into the second and see what could have been done differently for a smoother ride. When you add new territories to an old state, it helps if they speak the same language and have similar customs. It's way easier to manage, especially if they're not used to calling their own shots. Destroying the former ruling family and keeping laws and taxes steady will get them to blend in smoothly. Just look at places like Brittany and Burgundy in France. However, when you're dealing with places with different languages, customs or laws, that's when it gets tricky. Living there personally can really solidify your hold, just like the Turks did in Greece. Being present helps spot and solve problems early on, keeping both officials and locals in check. The locals have direct access to the prince, which keeps them content and builds loyalty or at least fear. Anyone trying to attack such a well-managed state would need to tread carefully. As long as the prince is there, taking it over won't be a walk in the park. Another smart move is setting up colonies in a couple of key spots. It's either this or stationing a ton of troops there. Colonies are the cheaper option. You send folks in, hand them some local land, and bam, you're done. Sure, you're ticking off the locals whose land you took, but they're left scattered and poor, so they can't really fight back. The others? They don't want to be next, so they stay quiet. Colonies, therefore, don't break the bank, are loyal, cause less harm, and the disgruntled ones can't do much about it. It's like, if you're going to hurt someone, go all in, because minor injuries people can recover from and come back at you, but serious ones, not so much. Stationing troops, on the other hand, is a money drain. You're spending all the local income on maintaining them. It turns the gain into a loss, irritates more people, and makes the entire state suffer. Everybody gets a taste of hardship and resentment grows. So troops, pretty much useless, whereas colonies, super useful. Moreover, if you're ruling a diverse place, be the leader and protector of the weaker neighbours and keep the stronger ones in check. And don't let any foreign power as strong as you get a foothold. Discontented locals might bring them in, just like what happened with the Romans in Greece. Usually, once a strong foreigner enters, other states rally to them due to their dislike of the current ruler. Keeping those states from gaining too much power and maintaining their goodwill, you can keep the stronger states under control and stay the boss. The Romans were pros at this. They set up colonies, kept friendly ties with smaller powers without bulking them up, suppressed the bigger ones, and didn't allow strong foreigners to gain control. Just look at Greece. They kept the Achaeans and Aetolians friendly, humbled Macedonia, and kicked out Antiochus. But they never let any of them get too powerful. The Romans knew the importance of foreseeing and dealing with issues early on. If troubles are spotted and tackled in the beginning, they're easy to fix. Leave them unattended, and they become incurable. It's like catching a disease early, easy to treat but hard to diagnose, and if left untreated, it becomes easy to diagnose but hard to treat. The same goes for state affairs, a wise ruler can foresee and address issues promptly, but if ignored, they become evident and unmanageable. The Romans, always strategic, dealt with potential wars and conflicts head-on, choosing to confront Philip and Antiochus in Greece rather than waiting for them in Italy. They could have avoided conflict, but they preferred to rely on their own valour and wisdom, knowing that time can bring both good and bad. They didn't just enjoy the benefits of their time, they actively shaped them with their actions and foresight. So let's shift our focus to France and see if they've been following any of these principles. I'm going to focus on King Louis, not Charles, since Louis had his hands on Italy for a longer time and his moves are more telling. You'll see, he pretty much did the exact opposite of what you'd expect to keep a diverse state under control. Louis was brought into Italy by the ambitious Venetians, who were hoping to grab a good chunk of Lombardy with his help. I won't criticise Louis's decision because, wanting a piece of Italy and having zero friends there, thanks to Charles, he had to take whatever friendships came his way. If he hadn't made some mistakes, his plan would have worked out pretty quickly. Once he got Lombardy, he instantly regained the influence Charles lost. Genoa surrendered. Florence played nice. A bunch of lords and cities were lining up to be buddies. 
The Venetians were left slapping their foreheads, realizing their scheme to snag two towns turned Louis into the big boss of two-thirds of Italy. Now think about how easily Louis could have kept his grip on Italy if he just stuck to the guidelines and kept his pals safe and happy. Sure, they were many, but they were also weak and scared, either of the church or the Venetians. They'd always have to stick with him, and with their help he could have kept the powerful ones in check and been the top dog in Italy. But nope, the moment he set foot in Milan, he started helping Pope Alexander snatch up the Romagna. He didn't realize that he was shooting himself in the foot, tossing away friends, making the church a powerhouse and setting himself up for trouble. And after this major mess up, he had to double down. He even had to come to Italy himself to curb Alexander's ambitions and stop him from grabbing Tuscany. And as if boosting the church and ditching friends wasn't enough, he went ahead and split the kingdom of Naples with the king of Spain. He turned from the main player in Italy to sharing the spotlight, giving the ambitious and unhappy a place to turn to. Instead of leaving his own puppet king in place, he booted him out and installed one who could kick Louis out in return. Wanting more is human nature, and when you can pull it off, kudos to you. But when you force it and fail, that's just dumb. If France could have tackled Naples alone, she should have. If not, splitting it was a bad call. The deal with the Venetians in Lombardy was a strategic move to get a foothold in Italy, but splitting Naples? That was just a bad play. So, Louis made five big mistakes. He crushed the smaller powers, boosted a big one in Italy, brought in a foreign power, didn't settle in, and didn't send colonies. These mistakes alone wouldn't have ruined him if he hadn't made a sixth, messing with the Venetians' territories. If he hadn't empowered the church or brought Spain into the mix, humbling the Venetians would have made sense. But after his earlier moves, ruining them was a bad idea. They would have kept others from eyeing Lombardy, which they wouldn't have let anyone grab unless they were taking it. No one would dare cross both France and Venice for it. And if anyone's like, Louis gave Romagna to Alexander and Naples to Spain to avoid war, I'd say avoiding war is never a good excuse for messing up. You're only delaying a fight and putting yourself at a disadvantage. And if someone brings up the promises Louis made to the Pope in exchange for annulling his marriage and a sweet hat in Rouen, I'll get to the reliability of Prince's promises later, and why keeping them can be tricky. So King Louis ended up losing Lombardy because he didn't stick to the game plan used by those who've grabbed countries and managed to hold on to them. It's not some freak accident, it's just plain logic and pretty much expected. I remember chatting about this in Nantes with Rouen, when Valentino, as folks usually called Cesare Borgia, the son of Pope Alexander, was making moves in the Romagna. Cardinal Rouen threw shade at the Italians for not getting warfare, and I shot back that the French were clueless about statecraft. Otherwise, they wouldn't have let the church get so big and bad. And sure enough, it turned out that France had a big hand in beefing up the church in Spain in Italy, and ironically, her own downfall can be traced back to that move. This brings us to a golden rule that hardly ever fails. If you're the reason someone else is climbing up the power ladder, you're setting yourself up for a fall. Because here's the deal. That rise to the top is either through clever moves or brute force. And either way, the new big shot isn't going to trust the one who boosted him up. Chapter 4. Why Alexander's successors didn't face immediate rebellion in Asia. You see, when you look at the different ways countries have been ruled throughout history, you'll find two main setups. One's where a big boss the prince, and his crew run the show, the crew being in power, thanks to the prince's good graces. Then there's the other setup, where a prince and some noble barons rule. But these barons have their own territories and folks who love them for their noble bloodlines, not just because the prince said so. In the modern context, think of the Turk's rule as the first setup, where he's the sole big shot and everyone else is just working for him. He shuffles administrators around his sanjaks, and that's his way of keeping things under control. On the flip side, you've got the King of France, surrounded by a bunch of lords who have their own territories and people's loyalty. The king can't just strip them of their status without facing some serious backlash. So, snagging the Turk's kingdom? Tricky business? His ministers are slaves or bound to him, so turning them against him is tough. And even if you do, they can't bring the people with them. When you're going up against the Turk, you're dealing with unity and relying a lot on your own strength. But once you've beaten him and his family's out of the picture, holding onto that kingdom's a breeze, as there's no one left with any real influence. In contrast, France is a different beast. You could get a foot in the door by aligning with a disgruntled baron, but holding onto that power? That's where the real struggle begins, dealing with both those who helped you and those you defeated. Wiping out the ruling family isn't enough. The remaining lords can stir up trouble any time. Darius's rule was pretty similar to the Turks' setup, so all Alexander had to do was defeat him and take over. With Darius out of the picture, holding on to that state was pretty straightforward. The real issues only kicked in when his successors started their own internal power struggles. Holding a diverse state like France is never smooth sailing, hence the numerous revolts against the Romans in Spain, France and Greece. 
The existence of multiple principalities kept the Romans on their toes until the memory of these principalities faded, making their rule more secure. When the Romans fought among themselves, they could each hold on to their territories, and with the previous rulers' families gone, the Romans were the uncontested power. Remembering all this, it's no wonder Alexander had an easier time holding on to Asia compared to the struggles of folks like Pyrrhus. It's not about the conqueror's skill level. It's all about the diversity and unity of the conquered state. Chapter 5. Why it's tricky to manage cities used to freedom and what to do about it. When you've got states that were living under their own laws and were free before you stepped in, managing them can be tricky. You've basically got three options. First, you could totally destroy them. Second, you could move in and live there yourself. Or third, let them keep living under their own laws but make them pay you and set up a friendly government that owes you big time. This government, knowing it owes its existence to you, will do its best to have your back. Let's take the Spartans and the Romans as examples. The Spartans tried to control Athens and Thebes by setting up governments, but that didn't work out and they lost them. The Romans, on the other hand, took a different approach with Capua, Carthage and Numantia. They tore them down and kept control. They tried the Spartan way with Greece, letting them be free and keeping their laws, but it was a no-go. They had to destroy a bunch of cities to keep control. Honestly, if a city's used to freedom, the only surefire way to keep it is to ruin it. If you don't, expect the city to turn on you, because the call of freedom and old privileges are way too strong and unforgettable. No matter what you do, they'll rally to those ideas, like Pisa did after a hundred years under Florence. But if a place is used to a prince and then loses him, they're in a bind. They're used to obeying, but without the old ruler, they can't agree on a new one and don't know how to govern themselves. They're slow to fight back, making it easier for a new prince to win them over. Republics, though, they hold grudges. They want revenge, and they won't forget their old freedoms, making them harder to control. So, the safest bet. Either destroy them or pack your bags and move in. Chapter 6. Creating a Kingdom from Scratch, Using Your Own Skills don't be shocked if I pull up some of the greatest examples when talking about building entirely new principalities. Because let's face it, following in the footsteps of the greats is the way to go. It's like aiming higher than the target to make sure your arrow hits the mark. In totally new principalities, keeping control can be a mix of easy and hard, depending on the skill of the guy who got the power. But if you became a prince from scratch, you've got either skill or luck, and either way it's going to help. Still, Relying less on luck makes you stronger, and being hands-on in your new state is a bonus. Now looking at the self-made princes like Moses, Cyrus, Romulus, and Theseus, they're the real hotshots. Moses was doing God's work and talking to God, and the others, they crafted kingdoms with their smarts and skills, and they were as good as Moses, with or without divine guidance. They all needed the right moment. Without it, their genius would have been wasted, and without their genius, the opportunity would have been pointless. These guys needed the right conditions. Moses needed the Israelites oppressed in Egypt. Romulus needed to be abandoned. Cyrus needed the Persians unhappy with the Medes. And Theseus needed the Athenians scattered. So, yeah, opportunity made them lucky, but their abilities made their countries famous. Getting a principality through guts and smarts is tough, but keeping it is a breeze. The hard part is introducing new rules to ensure stability. People resist change, and you'll have haters who like the old ways and fans who are on the fence about the new. Innovators have a rough time because change is risky and people are skeptical. If you can't enforce your new order, you're toast like unarmed prophets while the armed ones win. People are fickle, easy to persuade, but hard to keep convinced. So, you've got to be ready to enforce belief when they stop believing. If the big guys like Moses and Romulus had been unarmed, their rules wouldn't have lasted. Just look at Savonarola. When people stopped believing in him, he couldn't keep the believers or convince the non-believers, so he failed. Climbing to the top is risky, but once you're there and your enemies are gone, you're golden, powerful, respected and happy. Let's throw in a smaller example, Hiero of Syracuse. This guy went from zero to hero, and he didn't rely on luck, just opportunity. The oppressed Syracusans picked him as their leader, and he showed he only needed a kingdom to be a king. He reshuffled the military, ditched old alliances, made new ones, and with his soldiers and allies, he built his kingdom. Getting there was hard, but keeping it, piece of cake. Chapter 7. On new principalities gained through others or good luck. Becoming a prince from just a citizen by sheer luck is like a flight. Easy ascent, but tricky to stay in the air. Think of those folks in Greece or Ionia, handed cities by Darius for his own safety and fame, or emperors rising through some shady dealings with soldiers. They're propped up by the whims and luck of their benefactors, not exactly stable foundations. Plus, if they aren't already wise and skilled, they'll struggle. They've lived private lives and suddenly they're ruling without a loyal army. 
like anything rushing to grow, states popping up overnight can easily topple, unless the new princes are smart enough to quickly secure their positions. Case in point, Francesco Sforza and Cesare Borgia. Francesco, using smarts and skills, climbed up to Duke of Milan and held it firm. Cesare, though, got his state while his dad was in power and lost it when the going got tough, despite being clever and doing everything right. It's never too late to lay solid foundations, but it'll be a challenging and risky task. Cesare, in fact, did lay strong foundations, but fate wasn't on his side. His father, Alexander VI, had ambitions for Cesare, but faced obstacles, especially in acquiring non-church states. The Venetians and Duke of Milan wouldn't allow it. Plus, the key armies in Italy, fearing papal power growth, were hesitant. Alexander had to shake things up, aided by the Venetians bringing the French back to Italy, which made securing Romagna for Cesare easier. However, Cesare faced loyalty issues from his forces and the French. He realised that relying on the Orsini forces and the French king was risky. The Orsini's reluctance in attacking Bologna and the king's intervention in Tuscany were red flags. Cesare decided, no more depending on others' armies and luck. He started by weakening the Orsini and Colonesi in Rome, winning over their supporters and offering them positions and pay, erasing their old allegiances. When the Orsini saw the rising power of Cesare and the church threatening them, rebellion sparked in Urbino and Romagna. Cesare, with French aid, managed to regain control. Not willing to rely on external forces again, Cesare used clever strategies to bring the Orsini into his power at Sinigalia and eliminated the leaders. He had now secured Romagna and the Duchy of Urbino, and people were beginning to enjoy prosperity under his rule. This smart move by Cesare is worth noting and emulating by others. When the duke stepped into power in Romagna, it was a land in disarray, governed by feeble rulers who preyed on their subjects rather than lead them. Desiring to establish peace and order, the duke appointed Messer Ramiro d'Orco, a man known for his harshness but effectiveness, who rapidly brought stability to the region. Yet, to avoid Ramiro becoming a target of public disdain due to his stringent methods, the duke set up a court of justice to ensure fair judgment, and subsequently had Ramiro executed to distance himself from the latter's cruelty. This act of public execution struck a balance between satisfaction and shock among the populace. Returning to the broader narrative of the Duke, he was consolidating power and forging alliances, notably as he recognised that the King of France, having realised his earlier miscalculations, would no longer back him. The Duke had his sights on Tuscany, having already secured a number of territories. With both France and Spain entangled in their own disputes, he took the opportunity to capture Pisa, and subsequently, Luca and Siena fell into his hands. The Duke had reached a point where he relied solely on his own capabilities and strategic acumen. However, the landscape shifted with Alexander's demise, leaving the Duke vulnerable, sandwiched between two formidable foes, and grappling with his deteriorating health. Nonetheless, the Duke was a figure of audacity and intelligence. Had it not been for the adversarial armies and his ailment, he could have potentially navigated through all the challenges. The region of Romagna showed allegiance, waiting for his return, and he maintained a stronghold in Rome. The Duke had meticulously planned for various contingencies, but his own impending death at the time of Alexander's passing was an unforeseen variable. Analyzing the Duke's maneuvers, it becomes challenging to pinpoint shortcomings. He serves as an exemplar for those ascending to governance through the influence or might of others. His lofty aspirations were curtailed solely by the untimely death of Alexander and his health's decline. The singular error in his strategy was endorsing the ascension of Julius II, a cardinal he had previously offended. The Duke should have supported a candidate he shared amicable relations with, like a Spaniard or Rouen. The assumption that recent favours would obliterate memories of past grievances is a misguided one, and this flawed judgement marked the unravelling of the Duke's reign. Chapter 8. On Rising to Power Through Dubious Means It's clear that people can rise from obscurity to power in ways that aren't solely based on luck or talent. I have to touch on these methods, even though one will get a deeper dive when we discuss republics. In essence, there are two main ways. One where you use sly, questionable tactics, and the other where you ride the wave of public approval. I'll drop two stories here, one old school and one more recent, as lessons for those who might be tempted by these roots. First, let's talk about Agathocles from Sicily. This guy started from the bottom. He was the son of a potter and led a life full of scandal. However, he was talented and ambitious. He climbed the military ranks and became the praetor of Syracuse. Once he had a taste of power, he wanted more and wasn't about to wait for permission. Partnering with Amilcar, the Carthaginian general, he set a trap for the city's elite. Pretending he wanted to chat about state issues, he gathered the city's top brass and on his command, his soldiers took them all out. Just like that, he became the big man in Syracuse without much fuss. 
He had some clashes with the Carthaginians, even got defeated a couple of times, but Dude was resilient. He even split his army, defended his city with half, and with the other half went on the offensive in Africa. Ultimately, the Carthaginians had to back off and leave Sicily to him. Now, was Agathocles just lucky? Nah. He made strategic moves one after the other, facing numerous challenges. But let's not call him a hero, all right? Killing your own people, betraying friends, and having no moral compass might win you power, but not respect. His bravery in face of danger and his relentless spirit might rank him among top-tier leaders, but his brutal methods and sheer wickedness tarnish his legacy. His rise to the top wasn't about fate or pure talent. Fast forward to more recent times during Alexander VI's era. There's this guy, Oliverotto da Fermo. Orphaned young, his uncle Giovanni Fogliani took him in. As he grew up, Oliverotto went off to be a soldier under Pagolo Vitelli, then under Pagolo's bro, Vitellozzo. He was smart, strong, and quickly became a big deal in the military scene. But serving under others, not his style. So with some shady locals and the Vitelleschi clan, he plotted to take over Fermo. He wrote to his uncle Giovanni, painting a picture of a prodigal nephew's return, even hinting he'd be coming with a hundred horsemen just for the aesthetics of it all. He wanted a grand welcome, not just for himself, but to show his uncle's prestige too. Little did the city know what he had up his sleeve. So Giovanni, being a good uncle, rolled out the red carpet for Oliverotto. The people of Fermo gave him a warm welcome and Giovanni housed him. After chilling for a bit and setting up his dark plans, Oliverotto threw a fancy dinner party. He invited Giovanni and the bigwigs of Fermo. Once they had eaten their fill and were probably feeling a little tipsy, Oliverotto switched gears. He started this serious talk about how awesome Pope Alexander and his son Cesare were. Giovanni and the crew played along, but then Oliverotto pulled a classic, let's move this convo somewhere private move. Once they were all in a room, boom! Out of nowhere, soldiers jumped out and took them all out, including his own uncle. Oliverotto then paraded around town, flexing his newfound power. He basically put the mayor under siege, making the townspeople super scared and forcing them to accept him as the new boss. He made sure anyone who could be a threat got the axe, setting up new rules and getting both the political and military scenes on lock. For that year, not only was he the top dog in Fermo, but even the neighbouring areas were kind of wary of him. But just like most villains, he met his downfall when he underestimated Cesare Borgia. Cesare trapped him in Sinigalia, and a year after his big power move, Oliverotto and his main man Vitellozzo were strangled. Now, you might be scratching your head thinking, how did guys like Agathocles and Oliverotto, with all their backstabbing and brutality, manage to remain in power for so long without their own people taking them down? Well, it's all about how you use that brutality. The smart way? Do all your dark deeds at once, make sure they're absolutely necessary for staying in power, then dial it back and maybe do something good for your subjects. The dumb way? Keep the brutality coming day after day. The first way can actually make you kind of stable like Agathocles. The second? You're just setting yourself up for a fall. Take a note, would-be rulers. If you're going to seize power, you better do all your dirty work in one go. It's like ripping off a band-aid. Do it quick, then calm things down, and maybe, just maybe, people will start to like you again. If you keep hurting your people every day, trust me, they'll never have your back. Also, spread out the good stuff. Make it last. Make it count. Most importantly, as a leader, be consistent. Don't flip-flop, especially when times get tough. If you suddenly try to play nice after being a tyrant, no one's buying it. And if you try to get tough after playing Mr. Nice Guy, too little, too late, and no one's thanking you for it. Chapter 9. About Civil Leadership When a well-known citizen becomes the leader of his country through the approval of his peers, rather than by cunning or extreme force, we can say he's gotten a civil leadership. To get this, you don't need to be a genius or ridiculously lucky, but being clever and likeable helps a ton. Here's the thing. In every city, there are usually two groups, the regular folks and the nobles. The common people don't want to be bossed around by the nobles. And the nobles, well, they want to do the bossing. This dynamic can lead to three outcomes. Someone gets to be the leader, the people govern themselves, or everything goes into chaos. Leadership can come either from the people or the nobles, depending on who's got the upper hand. The nobles, to flex their muscles, might back one of their own to be the leader. They do this to achieve their own goals under this new leader's protection. The people, not wanting to be under the noble's thumb, do the same. They rally behind someone to defend them. Now, if you get to be the leader with the noble's help, you've got your work cut out for you because they'll see themselves as your equals and managing them will be a headache. But if the people are your fan base, you'll find fewer obstacles and more willingness to follow. Also, you can't really keep the nobles happy without stepping on some toes, but satisfying the people is doable as they just don't want to be oppressed. A leader has to worry more about a peeved populace because there's strength in numbers. If the nobles turn against you, you can still manage, but if the people do, you're in real trouble. The worst the people can do is abandon you, but the nobles can actively work against you. 
So dealing with nobles, you can categorize them, those totally on your side and those not really committed. The committed ones, as long as they aren't too greedy, should be valued and respected. The non-committed ones might either be naturally timid, but can still be useful, or they might be looking out for their own interests, in which case, watch out, they can turn against you when things go south. The leader who has the people's support should maintain that relationship. This isn't hard. They just don't want to be mistreated. If a leader gets the position with the noble's support and against the people's wishes, winning the people over should be a priority. When people receive kindness from someone they didn't expect, they become even more loyal. There are various ways a leader can win people's affection depending on the situation, but it's crucial to keep the people on your side. Nabis, a Spartan prince, managed to defend against all of Greece and a victorious Roman army. He only needed to secure support from a few key people, but without the people's support, it would have been a different story. It's a mistake to think building on people's support is like building on mud. Sure, it can be tricky if a regular citizen relies solely on the people for defense against enemies or authorities, but a courageous and competent leader who earns and maintains the people's trust will find a solid foundation. Civil leadership faces challenges when transitioning from a shared to an absolute form of government. Leaders either govern directly or through officials. The latter is less stable and secure, as it depends on the goodwill of those in power, who can easily overturn the government during tumultuous times. In such times, a leader might struggle to assert authority as people are used to following officials. There will be a shortage of trustworthy people during crises. A wise leader ensures that in all circumstances, citizens rely on him and the state, securing their loyalty. Chapter 10. Measuring the Strength of a Principality We need to discuss another crucial point when we're looking at the nature of principalities. We've got to figure out whether a prince can stand on his own two feet, or if he's always going to be needing a helping hand. What I mean is, can a prince handle his business with what he's got, like enough people or money to raise an army strong enough to face any attacker? Or is he the type who can't really confront an enemy directly and has to hide behind city walls? We've talked about the first type before, but we might come back to it if we need to. For the second type, all I can say is they better make sure their towns are fortified and well stocked, and forget about trying to defend the countryside. When a prince has a strong city and isn't hated by his people, he's in a good spot. No one's going to attack him without thinking twice, because people don't like going into situations where they can see it's going to be tough, and trying to attack a well-fortified city with a prince who's got the people's backing, that's not going to be easy. Look at German cities. They're totally independent, don't have much land around them, and only answer to the emperor when they feel like it. They don't fear any nearby power because they're so well fortified. They've got the right defenses, plenty of artillery and enough supplies to last a year. Plus, they keep their people busy with important work and hold military exercises in high regard. So, a prince with a strong city and a good reputation isn't going to be attacked, and if someone tries, they're going to leave with their tail between their legs. And here's another thing, the world is pretty unpredictable, so keeping an army in the field for a whole year without something happening is nearly impossible. Someone might argue, but what if the people have property outside the city and it gets destroyed during a siege? Won't they turn against the prince? To that, I'd say, a strong and clever prince will know how to handle this. He'll keep his people's spirits up, make them fear the enemy, and stay on the good side of those who seem too ambitious. Usually, an enemy will start by destroying the countryside. That's when people are still fired up and ready to defend their lands, so the prince shouldn't hesitate to act. By the time the initial shock has worn off, the damage is done and there's no going back. People are more likely to rally behind their prince, especially if they've lost their homes defending him. People tend to feel a sense of loyalty to those they've helped just as much as to those who've helped them, so if a prince plays his cards right, it won't be too hard to keep his people's loyalty from start to finish. Chapter 11. On Ecclesiastical Principalities all right, now let's chat about ecclesiastical principalities. Getting hold of these is the tricky part, but once you have them, they're a breeze to maintain. Why? Because they're backed by religious traditions, which are super powerful. It doesn't really matter how the princes in charge act or live, these principalities stay put. The rulers don't have to defend or govern in the usual sense, and yet they don't lose any ground, and the people don't seem to mind. It's like they're stuck, neither wanting nor able to break free. These types of principalities are pretty much set and content. Since these places are upheld by divine powers beyond our understanding, I won't dwell on them too much. It'd be pretty audacious and reckless to dissect something sustained by God himself, don't you think? But if someone wonders how the church got so mighty considering that even the small-time lords in Italy didn't think much of temporal power, I'd say it's worth reminiscing a bit. 
I mean, it's pretty evident when you see a king of France shaking in his boots, with the church having the power to kick him out of Italy and bring Venice to its knees. Before Charles, King of France came into Italy, the Pope, the Venetians, the King of Naples, the Duke of Milan, and the Florentines were running the show. They were primarily worried about two things, no foreign power entering Italy and none of them grabbing more land. The Pope and the Venetians were the biggest concerns. To keep Venice in check, everyone else had to team up, and to control the Pope, they used the divided Roman barons, Orsini and Colonnesi. This division kept the Pope's power in check, making the papacy weak and ineffective. Every now and then, a gutsy pope like Sixtus would pop up, but neither luck nor smarts could get him out of this mess. The short tenure of a pope didn't help either. In about ten years, which is usually how long a pope lasts, he could barely make a dent in one faction, let alone both. Then came Alexander VI, showcasing how a well-armed and well-funded pope could truly dominate. With the help of Duke Valentino and the French, he achieved a lot, even though his main goal was to elevate the duke, not the church. However, after his death and the Duke's downfall, the Church inherited all their hard work. Next up, Pope Julius found the Church in a strong position, holding a lot of land and with reduced internal conflicts, thanks to Alexander's efforts. He figured out new ways to accumulate wealth and aimed to expand the Church's territories even more, all while keeping the factions in check. He managed to enhance the Church's power without empowering any individual excessively. So by the time Pope Leo came around, he inherited a mighty and influential Church. Hopefully he'll continue to elevate its stature and reverence through his virtues and goodness, building on the foundation laid by those who focused on military might. Chapter 12. The Different Types of Soldiers and the Problem with Mercenaries Having talked in detail about the nitty-gritty of principalities and how to get and keep them, it's now time to talk about the means of offence and defence each of them has. We've already established that a prince has to have a solid foundation, otherwise it's a one-way ticket to ruin. The building blocks of any state, whether new, old or a mix, are good laws and strong arms. Without being well-armed, good laws can't exist, so where there's solid military, you'll find solid laws. For now, let's put the laws aside and focus on the military. So a prince can defend his state using his own troops, mercenaries, auxiliaries, or a mix of these. Let me tell you, mercenaries and auxiliaries are a disaster waiting to happen. Relying on them is like building a house on quicksand. They're all over the place, undisciplined, unreliable, and downright cowardly in the face of real enemies. They neither fear God nor respect men. They're only in it for the paycheck which isn't enough to make them risk their lives for you. The moment trouble shows up, they're out of there faster than you can say, deserter. This has been Italy's downfall, placing all its bets on mercenaries, who might have seemed tough amongst themselves but crumbled when faced with real challenges. It's like we handed Italy over to Charles, King of France, on a silver platter. The sins of relying on mercenaries came back to bite the princes who employed them. Here's the thing. Mercenaries can either be skilled or not. If they're skilled, they're untrustworthy always aiming for personal glory at your expense. If they're not skilled, well, you're doomed the old-fashioned way. Some might argue, isn't anyone armed, mercenary or not, going to act in their own interest? Here's my two cents. If a prince or a republic has to go to war, a prince should lead in person, and a republic should send its own citizens. If a citizen doesn't do well, recall him. If he's good, make sure the laws keep him in command. History shows us that princes and republics fighting with their own troops achieve greatness, while mercenaries only cause harm. A republic armed with its own forces is less likely to fall under the rule of one of its citizens compared to one relying on foreign forces. Rome and Sparta remained armed and free for ages, and the Switzers are fully armed and totally free. Looking back, the Carthaginians, who had their own citizens as captains, were oppressed by their mercenary soldiers after their first war with the Romans. After Epaminondas died, the Thebans made Philip of Macedon their captain, and after gaining victory he stripped them of their freedom. After Duke Filippo passed away, the Milanese brought in Francesco Sforza to deal with the Venetians. Francesco, after besting the enemy, turned on the Milanese and allied with the Venetians. Classic move. His dad Sforza had been working with Queen Johanna of Naples and left her high and dry, forcing her to seek help from the King of Aragon to save her kingdom. Now, you might wonder, the Venetians and Florentines expanded their territories using these kinds of soldiers, but their captains didn't seize power, right? Well, the Florentines got lucky. The really capable captains, who could have been a threat, either didn't win, faced opposition, or had other ambitions. Giovanni Acuto is one such example. He didn't win, but if he had, Florence would have been at his mercy. Sforza had rivals. Francesco aimed for Lombardy. Braccio targeted the church and Naples. Fast forward a bit, the Florentines appointed Pagolo Vitelli, a guy who rose from obscurity to fame, as their captain. If he had taken Pisa, the Florentines would have had to play by his rules, or risk him joining their enemies. The Venetians, on the other hand, did great when they used their own people for war. 
but when they shifted to fighting on land, they ditched that approach and adopted the Italian way. Initially, they were fine because of their reputation and limited land, but as they expanded, problems arose. After winning with Carmignola, they realized he was a bit too chill for war, and fearing they wouldn't win any more with him, they were stuck in a bind and ultimately had to kill him. Following captains weren't much of a boon either, and they ended up losing much of what they gained over centuries in a single battle. With mercenaries, gains are slow and small, but losses, they're quick and devastating. Now let's get deeper into Italy, which has been playing the mercenary game for a long time. The landscape changed, the empire lost its charm, the pope got more power, cities rebelled against nobles, and many turned into republics. Since the church was run by priests and republics by civilians, neither used to fighting, they started hiring foreigners. Alberigo de Conio from Romagna was the first to make these mercenaries famous. From his school came Braccio and Sforza, who became the big shots of Italy. After them, a bunch of captains popped up, and what did they achieve? Italy got trampled by Charles, looted by Louis, wrecked by Ferdinand, and dissed by the Switzers. These captains worked to downgrade infantry to boost their own standing. They didn't have land and lived off their pay, so they couldn't afford a big infantry, which also meant less power. They focused on cavalry, which kept them in check. In an army of 20,000, you'd be hard-pressed to find 2,000-foot soldiers. These captains also had tricks up their sleeves to reduce their risks and efforts. They didn't kill in battles, took prisoners, didn't do night raids, and avoided winter campaigns. Camps weren't fortified, and night attacks were a no-no. These rules and tactics, aimed at making life easier for them, led Italy into a state of subjection and disgrace. Chapter 13. Thoughts on auxiliaries, mixed troops, and using your own forces. Let's talk about auxiliaries. These guys can be tricky, as history shows. Think of them like calling in a favour. You bring them in to help out, like Pope Julius did recently when his own troops didn't cut it against Ferrara. Sure, they might be solid fighters, but they can be a real gamble for the one who calls them in. Lose with them, you're toast. Win, you're still kind of stuck with them. Take Pope Julius II, for example. The guy wanted Ferrara and went all in with foreign help, but Lady Luck stepped in. His auxiliaries got beat at Ravenna, the Swiss turned the tables, and he didn't end up captive to either his enemies or his auxiliaries. Remember when the Florentines, lacking an army, brought in 10,000 French to snatch Pisa? Risky times. Or that time the Emperor of Constantinople sent 10,000 Turks into Greece, who then didn't want to leave. Yep, that's how Greece got in trouble. So, if you're not looking to conquer, maybe these troops are your jam, but remember, they can be more trouble than they're worth. At least with mercenaries, there's a bit of a buffer. They're not all from one place. You're paying them, and their leader isn't immediately going to turn on you. With mercenaries, cowardice is the main issue. With auxiliaries, it's their bravery that can be dangerous. Let's talk about Cesare Borgia. Started with French auxiliaries, moved to mercenaries when he felt the French were shaky, then, when figuring out these mercenaries were shady, ditched them for his own crew. He was much more respected with his own guys, showing the real power of having your own soldiers. And then there's Hero from Syracuse. Found out mercenaries weren't great, decided he couldn't keep or dismiss them, so he offed them and went solo. Even David from the Old Testament knew not to fight Goliath with Saul's gear. You've got to use what works for you. Borrowed power is like borrowed clothes. It either falls off or restricts you. Charles VII of France got it. After pushing the English out, he knew he needed his own dudes. His son, Louis, messed up by ditching infantry for the Swiss, elevating their rep and reducing the worth of his own troops. The French army became a mix, better than just mercenaries or auxiliaries, but still not as good as having your own solid crew. The problem is, people dive into things that look good initially, but don't see the hidden issues. Like, if the Roman Empire's first big mistake is examined, it all started with hiring the Goths. Rome's strength started diminishing, and their courage transferred to others. So here's the conclusion. No kingdom is safe without its own forces. It's all up to luck without the strength to defend against hardships. True power and reputation come from relying on your own strength. Your real forces are your people, your citizens. Everything else is just mercenaries or auxiliaries. Reflecting on this and looking at how Philip, Alexander the Great's dad, and various republics managed should give us all the guidance we need. Chapter 14. The Prince and the Art of War A prince should focus on nothing else but mastering the art of war. It's the real game-changer. It not only keeps born princes in power, but it can also elevate ordinary people to rulership. On the flip side, if a prince gets lazy and ignores military training, he's likely to lose his state. The key to gaining and keeping a state is being a master strategist and warrior. Take Francesco Sforza, for instance. The guy went from nobody to the Duke of Milan just because he was good at warfare. His kids, though, they dropped the ball, avoiding the difficulties of military life, and went from dukes to nobodies. Being unarmed makes a prince look weak, and that's a reputation no ruler should have. There's just no balance of power between the armed and the unarmed. 
It's unrealistic to expect armed folks to follow an unarmed leader, or for an unarmed guy to feel safe surrounded by armed guards. Disdain on one side, suspicion on the other, not a good mix. A prince who doesn't get war can't earn the respect or trust of his soldiers. So, a prince should always have his head in the game, especially during peacetimes. He can do this in two ways, through action and study. In terms of action, it's all about keeping the troops in shape and getting to know the lay of the land. Knowing his country well not only aids in its defense, but also helps in understanding other territories, since landscapes are often similar. Philippiemen, prince of the Achaeans, was always thinking about military strategies, even when chilling with friends in the countryside. They'd have discussions about hypothetical battle scenarios, which helped him to be prepared for any unexpected situations in war. In addition to this, a prince should read up on history, learning from the successes and failures of great men in war. It's all about learning from the best. Alexander the Great looked up to Achilles, Caesar had Alexander as his role model, and Scipio admired Cyrus. Reading about Cyrus, as written by Xenophon, one can see how Scipio mirrored Cyrus's qualities like chastity, kindness, and generosity. A savvy prince follows these guidelines, staying proactive in peaceful times and building up resources. That way, if luck takes a turn, he's ready to face the challenges head on. Chapter 15. What gets you praise or blame? Now, let's talk about how a prince should act towards his subjects and friends. I know, I know, a lot of folks have written about this, and I might sound bold for rehashing it. But, I'm aiming for real talk here. No sugarcoating or daydreaming about utopias. The reality is there's a big gap between how we live and how we should live. If you're too focused on being Mr. Virtuous, ignoring the real world around you, you're heading for a fall. So, a prince needs to know the rules of the game, including the dirty tricks, and use them when needed. Ditching the fantasies, let's discuss the real deal. Everyone, especially those in power, gets labelled. Some are called generous, others stingy, and by stingy I mean holding back too much of their own, not robbing others. Some are called kind, others cruel, some faithful, others not so much, some brave, others cowardly, some friendly, others arrogant, some chaste, others, well, not. Some straightforward, others tricky, some serious, others not taking things seriously, some religious, others skeptical, and so on. Sure, it would be awesome for a prince to embody all the good traits, but let's be real, it's not happening, human nature won't allow it. A prince needs to be wise enough to dodge the blame for vices that could cost him his state and if possible, avoid the ones that won't. But since no one is perfect, he might have to embrace some of those less than stellar qualities. He shouldn't stress about being blamed for vices that are essential for ruling. When you think about it, some actions might seem virtuous but can lead to a downfall, while some vices can actually bring about success and stability. Chapter 16. On being generous or tight-fisted. So let's start with being generous. It's cool to have a rep for being generous, but here's the kicker. If you're generous in a way that doesn't get noticed, it backfires. If you're doing it right and nobody sees, you'll still get called tight-fisted. So anyone aiming to be known as generous will have to go all out. A prince like that will burn through his cash, and then, to keep the generous rep, he'll have to tax the heck out of his people and scrape together every cent. That's a one-way ticket to Unpopularville. Once he's broke, nobody values him. With his generosity pleasing a few and annoying many, he's in hot water at the first sign of trouble. So, if a prince can't be generous without it costing him, he shouldn't worry about being called tight-fisted. In the long run, he'll be better off, with enough funds to defend himself and take on projects without squeezing his people dry. He's seen as generous by the many he doesn't take from, and tight-fisted by the few he doesn't give to. The big shots in our times who've done great things are the ones seen as tight-fisted. The rest flopped. Pope Julius II got to be Pope with a generous rep, but he didn't keep it up, waging wars without extra taxes thanks to his thriftiness. The current king of Spain wouldn't have achieved so much if he'd been seen as generous. So, as long as a prince doesn't rob his subjects, can defend himself, doesn't go broke, and isn't forced to be greedy, being seen as tight-fisted shouldn't bother him. It's one of those vices that help him rule. Now you might say, Caesar rose to power by being generous. And sure, some folks hit the top by being and seeming generous. But here's the thing. If you're already a prince or on your way to becoming one, being generous is either risky or necessary. Caesar needed to be generous to climb the ladder in Rome, but if he hadn't cut back on spending later, he would have crashed and burned. If a prince uses his own or his subject's money, he should be frugal. If he's using someone else's, generosity is the way to go. A prince leading an army, living off plunder and extortions, has to be generous to keep his troops happy. Splurging with others' money, like Cyrus, Caesar and Alexander, boosts your rep. It's spending your own that hurts you. Generosity runs out fast. While you're at it, you lose the ability to be generous, leaving you either broke and despised or avoiding poverty, greedy and hated. 
A prince's top priority is avoiding being despised and hated, and generosity can get you both. It's smarter to have a rep for being tight-fisted, which might get you some flack but not hatred, than to chase a generous rep and end up labelled greedy, attracting both criticism and hatred. Chapter 17. On balancing mercy and severity, and the debate between being loved and feared. Let's talk about a leader's balance between being merciful and being severe. It's generally a good idea for a ruler to be known as merciful rather than cruel, but this mercy shouldn't be misused. Take Cesare Borgia, for example, he was known as cruel, but his severity brought peace and loyalty to Romagna. In comparison, the Florentines, trying to avoid a cruel reputation, let Pistoia be destroyed. So, a ruler shouldn't worry about a reputation of cruelty as long as it keeps his people united and loyal. It's better to be a bit harsh and maintain order than to be overly merciful and let chaos ensue. Especially for new rulers, it's nearly impossible to avoid being labelled cruel, because new reigns are full of challenges. But a ruler should act with caution and humanity, and avoid showing fear, to ensure that he's neither too trusting nor too harsh. Now let's address the age-old question, is it better to be loved or feared? Ideally, a ruler would be both, but since that's tricky, it's generally safer to be feared. People can be ungrateful, selfish and fickle. They'll be loyal when it's convenient, but will turn on you when things get tough. A ruler who relies solely on people's love, neglecting other precautions, is setting himself up for failure. People are less hesitant to upset a loved ruler than a feared one because love relies on a sense of obligation which people often disregard, while fear of punishment is a much more consistent motivator. However, a ruler should aim to be feared in a way that doesn't earn him hatred. He can manage being feared as long as he doesn't meddle with his citizens' property or personal lives. When taking serious actions against someone, it should be justified and transparent. People tend to forget personal losses faster than financial ones, and while reasons to confiscate property can easily be fabricated, reasons for harsher punishments are harder to come by. When a ruler is leading an army, it's crucial to maintain a level of severity to keep the troops in line. Hannibal, known for his cruelty and courage, managed to keep a diverse army united and loyal, proving that without a degree of fear, other virtues might not be enough to maintain order. Leaders like Scipio, although admirable, faced rebellions due to their leniency, proving that too much forbearance can harm a leader's reputation and authority. In conclusion, since people love at their own will, but fear at the will of the ruler, a smart ruler should focus on what he can control. The goal is to avoid hatred and maintain a balance between being loved and feared. Chapter 18. How Princes Should Keep Their Word Everybody agrees it's commendable for a prince to keep his word and act with integrity rather than cunning. However, history shows us that the most successful princes haven't placed much value on keeping their word. They've mastered the art of deception and have outsmarted those who trusted them. You see, there are two ways of fighting, one by law, the other by force. The first is natural to humans and the second to animals, but sometimes the first one just doesn't cut it and you have to resort to the second. This concept was metaphorically taught by ancient writers who said that princes like Achilles were raised by the centaur Chiron, half-beast, half-man, suggesting that a prince should know how to use both natures. A prince forced to act like a beast should choose both the fox and the lion since the lion isn't cunning enough and the fox isn't strong enough. Relying solely on strength or cunning won't get you far. A smart prince shouldn't keep his word when it's to his disadvantage or when the reasons for giving his word no longer apply. If everyone was good, this wouldn't be an issue, but people are not, so you don't have to feel bound to keep your promises to them. History is full of examples of princes breaking treaties and promises, and the most cunning ones have been the most successful. However, it's important to be a good actor and disguise this trait. People are simple and focused on immediate needs, so deceivers will always find someone to deceive. Take Alexander VI, for instance. He was a master of deception and always found someone to fool. He could make promises with conviction but never kept them, understanding this aspect of human nature very well. It's not essential for a prince to possess all the good qualities, but it's very useful to appear to have them. In fact, having and always displaying them could be harmful, while appearing to have them is beneficial. A prince should appear merciful, faithful, humane, religious and upright, and be so, but be ready to act contrary when necessary. A prince, especially a new one, often has to act against these virtues to maintain his rule, so he needs to be adaptable, sticking to the good when possible, but ready to turn if needed. He should never let anyone realise he lacks these virtues and should appear completely virtuous. Appearing religious is especially crucial, as people generally judge more by appearances than by actions. Everyone sees what you appear to be, few experience what you really are. The few who do won't dare to oppose the majority's opinion, especially when the state's majesty is defending it. 
People, especially princes, are judged by their outcomes. If a prince gains a reputation and keeps his state, his methods will be deemed honourable and he'll be praised. The majority of people are taken by appearances and results, and in the world the majority is what counts. There's a contemporary prince who shall remain nameless, who always talks about peace and good faith, but is the complete opposite. If he had been true to his word, he would have lost his reputation and kingdom a long time ago. Chapter 19. How to avoid being despised and hated. Now, diving into those characteristics we touched upon earlier, I want to focus on the key ones. Generally, a prince has to steer clear of anything that'll earn him hate or disdain. If he manages that, he's pretty much in the clear, with no need to worry about other criticisms. Nothing earns you hate faster than being greedy and disrespecting the property and personal lives of your subjects. Stay away from those, and you're golden. When people feel secure in their property and honor, they are content, and you just have to deal with a few ambitious ones, which isn't hard to manage. Being seen as indecisive, frivolous, weak, or unreliable makes a prince contemptible. He should dodge these like a pro and aim to project courage, seriousness, and strength. He should make it clear that his decisions are final, building a reputation that no one dares challenge. A prince who pulls this off earns respect, and it's tough to conspire against someone respected. If he's armed and has loyal allies, he's safe from external threats, keeping internal affairs peaceful unless there's already some internal strife. Even if external issues pop up, a well-prepared and wise prince can withstand the storm, just like Nabis the Spartan did. Regarding his subjects, the main concern during external turmoil is internal conspiracy. To prevent this, a prince should avoid being hated and keep the people happy, which is crucial. Being liked by the people is a strong defense against conspiracies since a conspirator always hopes to please the public. If displeasing the people is the only outcome, the conspirator will lack the courage to proceed. Conspiring is a risky business filled with fears, jealousy and the prospect of punishment. On the prince's side, there's the power of leadership, laws, friends and the state's protection, and adding the people's goodwill to the mix makes conspiring a near impossible task. History provides countless examples of this, but I'll mention just one from recent memory. Messer Annibale Bentivogli, the former prince of Bologna, was assassinated by the Caneschi. The only family member left was Messer Giovanni, just a child then. After the murder, the people turned on the Caneschi, a testament to the goodwill the Bentivogli enjoyed. Although no one from the Bentivogli was fit to rule, the people hearing of a supposed Bentivogli in Florence brought him to govern until Messer Giovanni was ready. So when it comes to leadership, it's key for a leader to maintain the trust and respect of the people. If the people are hostile and resentful, the leader should be on guard. The best leaders, like in France, make sure not to push the powerful folks too far and keep the general population happy. France nailed it by having structures like the Parliament to keep a balance between the nobles and the common people. Now some might argue that looking at the Roman emperors, my theory doesn't hold up as some emperors were noble and still met unfortunate ends. To address this, let's consider the emperors from Marcus the philosopher to Maximinus. They had a variety of challenges, not only dealing with the ambition of the nobles and the discontent of the people, but also managing the soldiers' greed and aggression. The soldiers' desire for war and the people's wish for peace put emperors in a tough spot. It was challenging to please both, especially for new emperors who often leaned towards satisfying the soldiers to maintain their support. This approach could either work in their favour or lead to their downfall, depending on how well they could assert authority. Marcus, Pertinax and Alexander, all men of virtue, faced different fates. Marcus succeeded as he inherited the throne and balanced both nobles and people. Pertinax, on the other hand, had a short-lived reign as he couldn't meet the soldiers' expectations. Alexander, despite his just reign, was deemed weak and was ultimately overthrown. In contrast, Commodus, Severus, Antoninus Caracalla and Maximinus were ruthless leaders, oppressing the people to keep the soldiers happy. Severus, however, managed to earn respect and maintain his reign through his valour, balancing fear and admiration among both soldiers and people. His cunning and bold strategies, like deceiving Albinus and defeating Niger, showcased his ability to adapt and assert power, earning him a secure and respected position in the empire. Severus played the game well, acting both as a cunning fox and a fierce lion, keeping everyone on their toes. Despite being a newcomer, he held on to power effectively, using his reputation as a shield against any resentment for his tough methods. Antoninus was a standout guy, well liked by both the people and the soldiers for his toughness and simple tastes, but man, was he also ruthless. After countless individual murders, he wiped out large numbers of people in Rome and Alexandria, making him universally hated and feared. Ultimately, one of his own, a centurion, took him out. This serves as a reminder to leaders that anyone not afraid to die can pose a threat, but these incidents are pretty rare. Moving on to Commodus, this guy had it easy, inheriting the empire from Marcus. 
All he had to do was follow his dad's example and everyone would have loved him, but nope. He was naturally cruel and spent his time amusing the soldiers and exploiting the people. He even fought with gladiators, tarnishing the imperial image, which led to him being both hated and disregarded. Unsurprisingly, a conspiracy was formed and he was killed. Next up, Maximinus. This guy was all about war, and after the soldiers had enough of Alexander's softness, they killed him and put Maximinus in charge, but he didn't last long. His past as a shepherd in Thrace and his delay in getting to Rome made him lose respect. On top of that, he was super cruel, causing a rebellion starting in Africa, then spreading to Rome, Italy, and even his own army turned against him and killed him. I won't bother with Heliogabalus, Macrinus, or Julian. They were irrelevant and got taken out quickly. Wrapping this up, modern leaders don't have to worry as much about keeping the soldiers happy. The people hold more power now, except maybe for the Turk and the Soldan who still rely heavily on their military. The Soldan's state is a bit unique. It's more like a religious principality where the ruler is elected, so it's neither truly hereditary nor new. Looking back, it's clear that hatred or contempt led to the downfall of these emperors. Those who were new to power, like Pertinax and Alexander, couldn't exactly mimic Marcus, while those who were violent and cruel, like Caracalla, Commodus and Maximinus, couldn't follow in Severus's footsteps. A new prince needs to learn from both, pick up the necessary traits from Severus to establish his state and adopt the admirable qualities from Marcus to maintain a stable and secure rule. Chapter 20. The Pros and Cons of Fortresses and Other Strategies Princes employ various strategies to secure their rule. Some disarm their subjects, others fuel factions within their towns, and some even foster animosity against themselves. Building fortresses is also a common tactic. The effectiveness of these strategies varies depending on the specific circumstances of each state, but let's try to delve into the subject as broadly as possible. Firstly, let's discuss arming subjects. A new prince should never disarm his subjects. If he finds them unarmed, he should arm them. This way, the armed subjects become loyal supporters. Those not armed understand this differentiation and often excuse the prince as they realize that those facing greater risks deserve more rewards. Disarming subjects only breeds mistrust and forces the prince to rely on mercenaries who are unreliable. But when a prince acquires a new state, it's usually wise to disarm its inhabitants, except those loyal to him. Over time, even the loyal ones should be gently eased out of their martial ways. It's essential that the armed men in a state are solely the prince's own soldiers. Historically, rulers like our forefathers kept cities like Pistoia and Pisa under control through factions and fortresses, respectively. This approach might have worked when Italy was somewhat balanced, but today divided cities are quickly conquered by enemies. Fostering factions is seen as a sign of weakness and only proves beneficial in times of peace. Surmounting challenges makes princes great. A wise prince, when possible, might even cultivate some animosity against himself to rise higher after quashing it. New princes often find more loyalty among those initially distrusted. It's crucial for a prince to understand the motives of those who supported him. Making friends with former enemies can sometimes be easier than satisfying discontented supporters. Building fortresses has been a traditional way for princes to secure their states. Fortresses can act as a deterrent to potential conspirators and a refuge during attacks. However, their utility depends on the circumstances. A prince more fearful of his people than foreigners should build fortresses and vice versa. For example, the castle of Milan, built by Francesco Sforza, caused more trouble for the house of Sforza than any other disruption. The best fortress a prince can have is the love of his people. If the people hate you, no fortress will save you, as there will always be foreigners willing to help them. The only time a fortress was helpful in recent times was for the Countess of Forli when her consort was killed. However, when attacked by Cesare Borgia and the people turned against her, the fortress was of little value. In conclusion, building fortresses can be as commendable as not building them, but relying solely on them while neglecting the people's sentiment is blameworthy. Chapter 21. How a Prince Can Gain Fame Being known for grand endeavours and setting a solid example is what elevates a prince's reputation. Take Ferdinand of Aragon, the current king of Spain, for instance. His journey from a lesser-known king to the leading figure in Christendom is quite impressive, marked by extraordinary deeds like attacking Granada, which laid the foundation for his kingdom. Ferdinand played it smart. He kept the barons of Castile focused on the war, and before they knew it, he was gaining authority over them. Using funds from the church and the people, he built his military prowess. Cloaked in religious fervour, he expelled the Moors, a bold move indeed. This same guise allowed him to venture into Africa, Italy, and even France, leaving his subjects in awe and suspense. Setting unique examples in internal affairs also boosts a prince's reputation. Like Messer Bernabo da Milano did, rewarding or punishing extraordinary actions makes people talk. 
A prince should strive to earn a reputation as a great and remarkable leader. A prince earns this respect by taking clear stances. Being a true friend or a straight-up enemy is better than sitting on the fence. Choosing a side is always more beneficial. If your powerful neighbors are at odds and one conquers, you'll either fear him or not. Declaring your stance and engaging in the fight is the safer bet. The conqueror won't favor the indecisive and the conquered won't shelter you. When Antiochus went into Greece, the Aetolians invited him to fight the Romans. The Romans and Antiochus both tried to sway the Achaeans. The Roman representative argued that neutrality would leave them at the mercy of the conqueror. Indecisive princes often choose neutrality to avoid immediate danger and usually end up ruined. By courageously taking a side, a prince forms bonds, even with a powerful victor. When the opponents are evenly matched, allying is prudent. You help in defeating one, leaving the victor in your debt. However, a prince should be wary of allying with someone stronger and less necessary to avoid being at their mercy. The Venetians learned this the hard way by allying with France against the Duke of Milan. Governments shouldn't expect only safe options. They'll have to make risky choices. The key is distinguishing between troubles and opting for the lesser evil. A prince should also be a patron of talent and honor those skilled in every art. He should encourage citizens to engage in trade, agriculture, and other occupations, assuring them of rewards and security. Hosting festivals and spectacles and engaging with various guilds or societies in the city builds a connection with the people. While doing so, a prince must maintain his dignity and never compromise his rank. Chapter 22 On a Prince's Servants The people a prince chooses to have around him, particularly his servants, say a lot about his judgment. It's through this crew you first gauge a prince's smarts. If he's surrounded by capable and loyal folks, give him props. He knows how to pick them and keep them true. But if his crew is sketchy, it reflects poorly on him. Choosing them was his first mistake. Take the case of Antonio da Venafro serving Pandolfo Petrucci, the big guy in Siena. Anyone who knew Antonio would bet on Pandolfo being pretty sharp for having such a guy on his team. See, there are three types of smarts. Those who get it on their own, those who get it when others explain, and those who don't get it at all. The first is gold, the second's decent, and the third's just useless. So, if Pandolfo wasn't a genius himself, he was at least smart enough to recognize and value it in Antonio, keeping him honest and on point. But how does a prince gauge a servant's loyalty? There's a foolproof test. If a servant is all about his own interest more than the prince's, that's a red flag. That guy can never be truly loyal because anyone holding power for another should put that person's interest above all. A prince's affairs should always be top priority to his servants. To keep a servant straight, a prince has to play it smart, honor him, reward him, be kind, and share responsibilities and honors. But at the same time, the servant should realize he's not irreplaceable. The prince needs to balance the scales so that the servant doesn't get too greedy or anxious. When both prince and servant get this dynamic, trust is solid, but if this balance tips, it's a recipe for disaster for either party. Chapter 23. Beware of the brown noses. Let's chat about a major pitfall for any leader, the world of brown noses and yes men. Courts are crawling with these people because let's face it, we all love hearing how great we are. But flattery is like a drug, addictive and dangerous. The tricky part is, if you completely shut down any form of flattery, people might start thinking you're unapproachable. You need to strike a balance where people know they can be honest with you without fearing the backlash. But if everyone's brutally honest all the time, they might lose some respect for you. The game plan for any wise leader is to choose a tight-knit group of smart, honest advisors. Give them exclusive rights to speak their minds, but only about stuff you ask them. Always be curious. Ask them about everything, hear them out, but then make your own call. Make it crystal clear to them. The more straight up they are, the more you'll value them. Anyone outside this inner circle, nod and smile, but keep your plans to yourself. Flip-flopping based on everyone's two cents is a surefire way to lose respect and credibility. Look at Emperor Maximilian. Guy didn't talk much, kept things under wraps, but he also didn't really have a solid plan. The moment he made a move, his people would block him because they weren't clued in. He'd then change tactics and no one could ever guess his next move. Not exactly the kind of leadership that inspires confidence. So a leader should seek advice only when they want to, not when they're told to. And they should be the ones asking questions. If anyone's caught lying or sugarcoating, show them the door. Some might argue that a leader's wisdom is just a reflection of their advisors. That's a load of bull. A clueless leader can't recognize or value solid advice, unless, by some miracle, they've handed all their affairs to a super smart advisor. But even then, how long until that advisor decides to take the reins? When a leader asks multiple people for advice, it gets messy. Everyone's got an agenda, and if a leader can't see through that, it's chaos. Trustworthy advisors are rare. Real talk. A leader's good decisions come from their own smarts, not just the advice they get. Chapter 24. 
why Italy's big shots lost their game. When a newcomer takes charge and nails it from the start, they can quickly earn respect, maybe even more than those born into power. See, every move of the new kid on the block is under the microscope. If they're on point, people will rally around them even stronger than they would for someone with an old family name. It's all about the here and now. Give people what they want today and they'll have your back. Deliver on promises and they'll stand by you, rain or shine. It's a major win to create a new power base and build it upright. But if you're born with a silver spoon and you mess it up, man, that's a fail of epic proportions. Just look at the heavy hitters in Italy who crashed and burned, the King of Naples, the Duke of Milan and others. They mostly had one glaring issue. They sucked at military stuff. But beyond that, they either ticked off the common folk or, even if they had the public's love, they messed up with the elite. If you've got enough firepower and avoid these pitfalls, you're golden. Take Philip of Macedon. No, not Alexander the Great's dad, the other one. Even up against the powerhouse Romans and Greeks, this guy held his ground for years. Sure, he was war-ready and had the people and nobility on his side. He might have lost a few cities here and there, but he kept the crown. So for all the fallen princes out there, don't blame bad luck. They got lazy. They were chilling in the good times, never imagining the storm ahead. That's a classic human blunder, thinking sunny days last forever. When the storm did hit, instead of standing firm, they thought about ditching, hoping maybe, just maybe, the people would miss them enough to bring them back. Banking on that last-ditch strategy is a bad move. You never want to crash and burn, thinking you'll find a saviour later. If someone does save you, it's not a secure deal. True security? That's all on you. Your success rides on your own hustle and grit. Chapter 25. Playing the game of luck and standing strong. I get that a lot of folks think the world's run by luck and the big guy upstairs, making them feel like their choices don't really matter. They think, why bother grinding? Just let the chips fall where they may. This vibe's been strong lately, with crazy stuff happening daily that no one saw coming. I sometimes vibe with this thinking, but I believe we've got some say in our fate. I see luck as a wild river, flooding everything in its path, moving dirt around, and you can't really fight against it. But when things calm down, you can set up barriers, so the next time it floods, it's not all chaos. That's how it is with luck. It flexes where there's no resistance. Look at Italy, where everything's been upside down. It's wide open, no barriers, no defence. If it had the guts like Germany, Spain or France, we wouldn't see all this drama. But let's get more personal. A ruler can be living large one day and hit rock bottom the next without changing a bit. This happens when you rely too much on luck or when you're out of sync with the times. People reach their goals, fame, money in different ways. Some play it safe, others rush in. Some use force, others are cunning. Some are patient, others not so much. Success comes when you vibe with the times. Your fortunes can flip when the times change. If you don't adapt, you're toast. But people often struggle to change their ways. They stick to what's worked before. And when it's time to switch it up, they're lost. Take Pope Julius II, the guy dove into everything head first and rolled with the times, always coming out on top. If he'd played it safe, he'd never have made it big. But if he'd faced a situation where he needed to be cautious, he'd be doomed. In the end, luck's fickle and people are stuck in their ways. When they align, it's a win. When they don't, it's a loss. I'd say it's better to be bold than safe. Luck's like a woman. If you want to keep her, you've got to take charge. She's into the bold, the ones who take risks and command her attention. Chapter 26. Liberate Italy from the Invaders. After thinking deeply about our current situation, I can't help but feel that now is the perfect time for a new leader to step up. The world seems ripe for someone wise and brave to set a new course that not only makes him a legend, but also benefits the people here. Honestly, I can't think of a better time than now. Think about it. Moses had to show his worth when the Israelites were captives, Cyrus shone when the Persians were under the thumb of the Medes, and Theseus stood out when the Athenians were scattered. Italy's current state, being more trampled on, scattered and oppressed than all those examples, is just setting the stage for someone to showcase true Italian grit and spirit. Sure, we've seen a few glimmers of hope here and there, folks who looked like they were going to turn things around. But luck wasn't on their side, and Italy's still waiting for a hero to put a stop to the mess in Lombardy, the scams in the kingdom, and the constant drains on Tuscany. Everywhere you look, people are praying for someone to rescue them from all this chaos. They're just waiting for a leader to rally behind. Honestly, who better than your family? You've got the bravery, the luck, and both God and the church backing you up. If you look at the big names from the past, they weren't doing anything more impressive or noble than what you could do right now. Here's the deal. We're on the right side of this fight. Wars are always nasty, but sometimes they're necessary. And when the only option left is to take up arms, you better believe those arms are sacred. Italy's ready to fight, and with the right leadership, there's no challenge too big. Look at the miracles that have set you up for success. Parting seas, guiding clouds, water from rocks, raining food. Everything's pointing to your rise. But remember, God's done his part. You need to step up for the rest. Here's another thing. 
Italy's got talent. I mean, in one-on-one -on -one fights, Italians are unmatched in strength and skill. But when it's army against army, we fall short. Why? It boils down to leadership. We've got plenty of strong individuals, but they aren't great at following orders. And without a standout leader, everyone thinks they know best. That's why our full Italian armies have, let's be honest, kind of sucked recently. So, if you want to be the hero Italy needs, first off, build a loyal army. Trust me, your own troops are always the best. They're loyal, true, and will be even better under a leader they respect and who treats them right. And here's a tip. While the Swiss and Spanish are tough, they've got weaknesses. Spaniards struggle against cavalry, and the Switzers get them in close combat with infantry, and they crumble. So, with the right strategy, you can totally outplay them. Now's the chance for Italy to finally meet its saviour. Can you even imagine the love and support you'd get from all the regions tired of these foreign invaders? The thirst for revenge? The unwavering loyalty? The sheer devotion? Who'd stand against you? Who wouldn't cheer for you? We're all sick of being ruled by outsiders, so why not seize this moment? Take up the mantle, be the hero, and lead Italy into a new era. Remember the old Italian valour. It's still alive and kicking in our hearts. And there we have it, brothers and sisters, a journey into the world of Machiavelli and the enigmas of the prince. As we close this chapter, I hope our exploration has ignited a spark of curiosity, not just about ancient strategies and tales, but about how these age-old methods still echo in the opportunistic corridors of politics today. By understanding the past, we gain a sharper lens to scrutinize and interpret the maneuvers of those in power in our modern world. Embarking on these historical voyages isn't just for fun, it's a call to arms in the realm of knowledge. And as every great leader knows, an army is stronger with unity. This is where you come in. By joining our Patreon, you become an essential part of our battalion, ensuring that we march forward, delving deeper into the chronicles of time. It's more than just support, it's standing side by side with us as we venture into the past. Before you head off to your next destination, if this video struck a chord or sparked a thought, consider sharing it with fellow knowledge seekers. And to ensure you're always on the front line for our next expedition, maybe give that notification bell a tap. Until our next rendezvous, keep the banners of curiosity flying high. Safe journeys, brothers and sisters.